we have uh, welcome to this session. Uh, we have two rules about picking people to introduce speakers and chair sessions. One is that we never pick introducers who are either great fans of the speaker or great enemies of the speaker. That's one rule. The other rule is I never introduce anybody except somebody at the beginning because I've got other stuff to do. But we've broken both rules in this case uh, uh, because I'm such a great fan of uh, Robert Sloan. And uh, it's a great privilege for me to introduce him here to all of you today. Uh, Robert Sloan, I was an undergraduate at Baylor University. One, one thing Robert Sloan and I share in common, he graduated from Baylor in 1970. He continued as an undergraduate. He continued his education at Princeton University and the University of Basel in Switzerland. He had a number of faculty positions around and returned to Baylor in 1983, where he achieved quite quickly a distinguished chair. He became the first and founding uh, uh, director of the, the dean of the new George Truett Seminary at Baylor, which was created at an exciting moment in the history of the Baptist uh, communion in the 1990s. And in 1995, he became the, uh, the president of Baylor University, where he served as president for, uh, for 10 years. Now, along the way, uh, Robert had a quite distinguished publishing career, mainly in scripture work. He also was a pastor as usually in a supply capacity at a number of the most significant Baptist churches in the state of Texas, uh, some, uh, something he still engages in. The significance of his career, uh, for those of us who are interested in the history of religious higher education in, uh, in this country, uh, could, could, hardly be, could hardly be greater. The 10 years he was president of Baylor University, 1995, to 2005, uh, I sort of say a minor miracle was uh, was worked, but it wasn't a minor miracle. It was a uh, it was a major miracle. The history of Christian higher education in this country throughout the 20th century had been a history that had taught us one lesson: that if you were to improve the academic quality of a university, that had to go hand in hand with lessening the commitment to the religious tradition of the college or university. We had seen the great Protestant universities slip into secularism across the country, and by the 1990s, a similar fate was awaiting Catholic universities. In fact, they were in the midst of it. Robert Sloan is a very young president of the um, well-funded and comfortable Baylor University in 1995 had the audacious thought, uh, audacities in the wind these days, the audacious thought that it might be possible to both return a university to a firmer commitment to its original founding uh, uh, religious uh, mission and at the same time transform it into a university of a much higher quality. He raised the money, he fought the battles, he inspired faculty all across this country. He made many friends and maybe even more enemies in, um, in doing so. This is a sort of great event today because we not only have Robert Sloan up here in front, but we have Don Schmeltikoff and David Jeffrey in the audience who were his two provosts uh, during this time. And the three of them did something that people thought um, it was impossible to do. They fought this battle and made a real difference. And the Baylor story continues in, of all places, Waco, Texas, uh, a town that we can't ever mention without people giggling. I've never kind of understood why people always giggle at Waco, Texas, but it's, uh, it goes on there. Robert is now pursuing uh, a new miracle at, in Houston, at Houston Baptist University, where he's also going to be pastoring a church starting uh, next year. There's, there is, when the histories when the histories of religious higher education in the 20th century are written, there will be a very large chapter on his work, his vision, and the transformation of, uh, of Baylor. It's also, and I can't uh, uh, keep from mentioning that for those of us at Notre Dame, there's been an interesting interplay. I think it's fair to say 
that in the early days of the Baylor miracle, in Robert Sloan's vision, a lot of ideas were, uh, were taken from things that we had done right here at Notre Dame. In more recent years, we have looked to Baylor as a model for things we might uh, do. I like to say around here that in 25 years, I suspect Baylor will be sending missionaries back to Notre Dame to recall us to, uh, to our task. <laughs> the one, but it's not all uh, happy news. Uh, Robert keeps stealing all of these people, uh, uh, or Baylor keeps stealing all these people, and Robert too, in some sense, from uh, from us here at Notre Dame. Dan McInerney, most recently, maybe you know, was the associate director of the center and has gone down to Baylor University. Robert is now president of Houston Baptist University and is doing exciting things there. He is uh, he's spoken on this campus many times before. Uh, we couldn't be happier to have him back, and he's going to speak to us in direct response to our uh, conference topic. I said to him, this better be a heck of a speech to live up to this title, this talk. The summons of freedom, the Pope, the Apostle Paul, and Alistair McIntyre, three heavy hitters. Join me in welcoming <laughs> Robert Sloan. David, thank you very much. I, I appreciate uh, those remarks. Thank you, too, for mentioning Don Schmelzikoff and David Lyle Jeffrey. Uh, there are quite a few Baylor colleagues uh, who are here, but I'm really glad that you called uh, particular attention to them because it was, uh, you know, our, a project, and it is an ongoing project of, uh, of many, and uh, it just uh, could not have been and would not be today if it were not for uh, these great colleagues. It's a privilege to be here uh, on the Notre Dame campus again. Over the last several years, I've had the opportunity had the opportunity to, to be here many times, uh, first in my capacity as president of Baylor University and now as a representative of Houston Baptist University. I want to thank David Solomon publicly for his friendship and his advocacy. And I know Don, David, and many others uh, in this room would uh, join me in this uh, word of, of uh, deep appreciation. I thanked him in private, but this is one of the first times in an appropriate public venue that I have had the opportunity to thank him for his support of the things we were trying to do at Baylor, uh, to see that the university maintained and indeed enriched its commitments as an institution of higher learning to all things uh, true good and faithful. David was a tireless advocate, both in person, uh, in presentations before faculty members, and even the Board of Regents, uh, and also in writing for our project. He continues uh, to be of support uh, to Baylor University and to the kinds of projects that many of us uh, are engaged in. And David, uh, we, we thank you. David was a tireless advocate not only because of his love for Baylor, as he has mentioned, he is an undergraduate of the institution, uh, but uh, more importantly, because of his commitment to the kinds of things uh, that all of us uh, were and continue to try to do uh, as institutions of higher learning. The kinds of things that in a Catholic setting are represented here. That is, a commitment to the relationship of the Christian faith to the life of the mind, and especially in its institutional expressions at universities like Notre Dame, Baylor, and, if I may uh, dare say, at Houston Baptist University. I also want to give my greetings and express my deep Christian affection for colleagues from Baylor who are here. Many of us, David, as you know and have suggested already, have been coming to Notre Dame uh, for many years. We have been inspired, encouraged, and informed uh, through particularly this conference, now uh, celebrating its 10th year, 10th conference, through this conference put on by the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture. And in the process, we have strengthened our ties with one another, both individually and institutionally. I certainly speak for myself, but I also think, David, that I can speak for many other colleagues when I say that this conference has been an indispensable source of nourishment for us and has encouraged us to pursue the flourishing we seek, both as individuals and as members of Christian institutions of higher learning. I'm now the president of Houston Baptist University, <clears throat> and though the university is much younger and much smaller than Baylor, we likewise seek 
uh, within our own environment, history, traditions, and context to be faithful as an institution committed to Christ and his church and to press forward in all the processes of questioning, evaluating, and rethinking that such commitments demand. We want to see our university grow with respect to academic programming and its ability to engage the world as we find it with the truth as we know it, revealed in Christ and expounded, tested, and renewed through the processes of academe and the traditions of the church. As I have now referred several times to the work of universities such as ours, the project, uh, such as ours in the project of Christian living and understanding, it is appropriate for me to further introduce my topic by admitting that I should add yet another word uh, to the title, as if it uh, didn't uh, imply too much already. Uh, I should have added, uh, or now I would include the word university, so that something like the Pope, the Apostle Paul, Alistair McIntyre, and the university uh, would have been a better title. Of course, um, what becomes uh, clear and self-serving in a title like that is that no one can possibly expect you to say anything significant about so many great topics uh, all included in one title, and uh, I dare say that's the case here. But I, I, I want to add the word university. I say that not only because such a title more accurately reflects the content of what I'm about to present, but it is uh, a way, I hope not obliquely, of saying several other things as well. First of all, I, I must clearly acknowledge not only my debt to Alistair McIntyre and the things I'm about to suggest, which I hope, it, should he ever uh, hear about this, would not prove to be an embarrassment to him, but I particularly want to call attention to his recent book, God, Philosophy, Universities, A Selective History of the Catholic Philosophical Tradition. Uh, by the way, April 22nd, uh, there will be a conference here. Uh, uh, on uh, this book, and it's already shaping up as a very, a very fine discussion of this particular work. This superb work is reflective of an undergraduate course he's taught on this campus under the same title I've, uh, since uh, 2004. While I have read other things about Professor McIntyre, and I recall years ago uh, struggling uh, with uh, After Virtue, it is this recent work that has not only helped my thinking considerably uh, as to the topics uh, implied uh, in the title uh, of this paper but, uh, and in the title of this book, but also proven to be a very helpful re-entry uh, for me. I'm not an expert in the thought of Alistair McIntyre, but this, is, this book has been a, a very welcomed uh, opportunity for me and this conference uh, being done uh, in his, uh, celebrating his 80th year has been the opportunity for me to make a, a welcomed uh, re-entry for myself back into the works of Professor McIntyre. In this connection, I might also mention uh, the McIntyre Reader, if you're, if you're interested, edited by Kelvin Knight, which includes a very fine introduction to the thinking of McIntyre. Uh, but uh, I digress. My, my point is that adding the word university to the title not only acknowledges my obvious debt to that particular work of Professor McIntyre's, but also allows me to draw upon my own experience of some 15 years as a university administrator, 13 of which uh, have been spent as a university president. In addition, adding the word university allows me to make the point mentioned several times in McIntyre's book, God, Philosophy, Universities, that is, the university is, by its very nature, the required setting, at least uh, in, in the world as we know it, it is the required setting for pursuing the kinds of questions that are necessary not only to the task of philosophy, but particularly uh, to analyzing and answering the kinds of questions that those of us committed to the Christian faith believe uh, it is necessary and desirable to pursue. Uh, I have three subtitles uh, to, this, uh, to this presentation. Uh, the University Today. Uh, I then want to offer uh, a, a theological, a, a provisional, brief uh, theological proposal, and you'll, you'll see why, I hope, in just a moment. And then I want to make some comments about the university uh, going forward. Uh, the university today. And uh, for this, uh, I, I draw upon uh, the, uh, I have an indebtedness to uh, Professor McIntyre. The nature of the university as we find it today is not at all amenable to the kinds of inquiries necessary, not only for the Christian faith, but for, I would argue, the full pursuit by anyone of the goods necessary to achieve an understanding both of our world and of what it means to be truly human. The enormous conflict that took place when I was Baylor's president did not begin with my presidency, nor with Baylor, but was in fact, as David himself has suggested, uh, part of a longer process of change within American universities. 
It involves uh, struggles uh, there that uh, continue to this present day, not only at Baylor, but in different ways and at different stages in the process, at different, and at different stages in the process at universities throughout the world. I was recently at a gathering of some very thoughtful cultural observers, and it was mentioned both uh, publicly and in casual conversations several times over a period of four days that Hollywood, the media, and academe are not only among the primary movers of American culture, a culture dominated uh, by a secularized modernity, but are themselves largely under the control of that very secularized modernity, especially, of course, the political and financial forces that enable and enforce the ongoing secularisms. I was fascinated to hear these pundits remark that they actually had some hope for Hollywood and the media, but, but none seemed qualified for or capable of uh, referring to academe. I did my best to speak to the question of academe, but the current situation, certainly as those observers saw it, and perhaps we, some of us can tentatively uh, agree, uh, is not promising for the role of higher education as a venue for analyzing, testing, and furthering the kinds of questions, and that phrase is important, the kinds of questions that most of us in this room are interested in and believe to be necessary components of our theistic commitments. As McIntyre points out, the university historically was organized to reflect its assumptions regarding the relationship of God to the totality of the creation. Now, however, instead of universities habitually asking questions of the interrelationship uh, between the disciplines, and indeed regarding the overall purpose of the collective projects of the disciplines, it, it's, it's the case that, that even in traditional and conservative small Christian uh, colleges, uh, one finds faculty who have no clue about uh, those kinds of questions and are a little bit put off uh, if you even ask them to think about such things as that because they want to, you know, get on with their, the real business of, of their disciplines. But instead of, instead of, uh, people at universities habitually asking questions of the interrelationship between the disciplines and indeed regarding the overall purpose of the collective projects of the universities, the university is now more a multiversity than a university. Its schools and departments are committed to an intellectual autonomy that, pro that promotes alongside, of course, the political structures and financial res uh, resources that reinforce uh, this autonomy, that promotes the in-depth pursuit of sub-disciplinary questions that increasingly increasingly restrict not only the breadth of conversations among colleagues across the university, but even within departments, and virtually eliminate the ability of any given specialization, much less the entire university as a community, to pursue the greater questions of how the work and achievements of the disciplines not only relate to one another, but might relate to the larger questions of the nature, meaning, and ultimate flourishing of the creation, both nature and human nature. However, though the condition of the university in American and Western culture today is less than suitable for the pursuit of these goods, we must not despair. If the university is the culturally dominant setting for such discussions, at least philosophically, of the nature and purpose of the whole of reality, then it is also a place where Benedict XVI's uh, reminder of the summons, to free, summons of freedom to sacrifice must be heard and must be followed as a dimension of civic life. Um, I want to repeat that. If it is the required social setting for these kinds of questions, given uh, the, the nature of uh, our, our cultural realities, then it is also a place, we should not despair because it is also a place where Benedict XVI's reminder of the summons of freedom to sacrifice must be heard and it must be followed as a dimension of our civic life and our civic uh, uh, responsibilities. The gift that is the university must be honored through the faithful exercise of the intellectual virtues for the sake of all those goods that promote human flourishing. Philosophy, according to McIntyre, and I now enter into, uh, I want to point now towards um, a, a theological proposal. Philosophy, according to McIntyre, is critical to the enterprises the questions that universities ought to ask and for which historically, around which historically they were, they were organized. Of philosophy, he has written, quote, because of the way in which philosophy 
because of the way in which philosophy has to open up and illuminate relationships between theology and the whole range of the secular disciplines, philosophical inquiry cannot be pursued in isolation from inquiry in those other disciplines, close quote. And, uh, of course, all of us, I'm sure, agree. McIntyre also carefully distinguishes between philosophy and theology and asserts the importance of theology. Of course, this book uh, is, is about uh, you know, philosophy and, and, and uh, selected history of philosophy in uh, Catholic universities. But he asserts the importance of theology as a, quote, key to the overall understanding of the nature of things. Given in the significance and distinctive functions of both theology and philosophy for the enterprise of the university, and certainly the Christian university, I want to offer a brief theological statement, or really a, perhaps a theological narrative, that is an attempt to provide a larger story that resonates with McIntyre's agenda for theology by its being consistent with Christian revelation, and in this case, uh, I will draw upon scripture, subject to philosophical analysis and useful to the task of philosophy in relating the various disciplines of the university to one another. I propose this forthcoming, admittedly, incomplete theological narrative as a starting point for Christian universities, believing that a narrative like this can inform and shape the whole without dictating the outcomes of any faithfully pursued research. Um, for the sake of convenience and brevity, mostly my convenience because I'm trained in uh, New Testament theology, particularly Pauline theology, I'm going to take Pauline theology as my point of departure, uh, not because I think that's the sum and substance of all of Christian revelation. There's obviously a Christian, uh, by the Christian tradition, we receive revelation both inside and, and outside of Scripture. Uh, but I'll take it as my point of departure, again, for, for convenience sake, uh, but especially, uh, I'm going to use a few texts in the book of Romans, not because I think Romans is, uh, is a kind of uh, summa theologica for Paul. I think it's an occasional piece, uh, as the other epistles are. Uh, having said that, though, there are uh, certain, it's an expansive uh, letter, and there are certain uh, uh, theological commitments that lie beneath the surface of this pastoral uh, exhortation, particularly that has to do with the the, the, the role of Jews and Gentiles uh, in, the, in, in the world and Paul's theological understanding of how Jew and Gentile are brought together in Christ. In the process of making this uh, kind of, 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 a, of pastoral appeal that points to the faithfulness of God, uh, Paul makes many assertions that have now become classic uh, proof texts in our theological traditions. And you'll hear me refer, for example, to Romans 1, uh, where you have uh, Paul's description, a kind of a theological uh, midrash, uh, an exegetical, an exposition of Genesis in which we find uh, references to creation and the fall and, uh, and human dysfunction and alienation. Uh, I'll refer to uh, Romans 2 and 3, whereby the universality of God's uh, equity and universality of God's ways of dealing with uh, all of his uh, human creatures is, is, uh, is expounded. I'll refer to um, to Romans. Uh, I'll refer to Romans, not in this uh, order. Uh, but I'll refer to Romans five, uh, where the uh, Christ, the second Adam, and the obedience of Christ is is pointed to as a theological. I'm going to refer to that as a as a sub narrative within Paul's larger uh, narrative. Uh, in Romans six, uh, there is, I think, a, a wonderful. Uh, exposition, or at least impl uh, an implication of a of a of a sub narrative, a large, I would say, you know, cosmic cosmological narrative that lies uh, rather obviously beneath uh, Romans six, uh, and uh, and it has the gospel uh, as it's, as a kind of sub narrative within it. But you get the full sweep of uh, Paul's, I think, uh, cosmology in Romans six, and then in Romans seven. We get, as we know, a, a, a very famous uh, sort of uh, existential creed de cour, uh, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this uh, uh, body of sin and death, and so on. So um, I, I pull on these samples because I think there's a theological expansiveness uh, in terms of the subjects implied, uh, even if they are not explicitly treated because it's a pastoral letter. Nonetheless, the, 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 there is a a narrative that uh, I think uh, makes sense as a theological narrative that 
that is uh, is sort of comprehensive and all encompassing and allows could allow Christian universities uh, with this kind of treatment or narrative to to operate uh, not only expansively in the disciplines. Uh, again, referring to McIntyre's op- historical observation that universities and all of their disciplines were organized based upon certain theistic assumptions uh, about you know the one God, the one Creator God, and who has created all there is, and uh, and the you know the gift of ration- of reason and so on, and uh, uh, the assumption that uh, that theology can provide this uh, larger narrative that. Uh, that engages all of us and also uh, with uh, the aid of philosophy, of course, allows for this uh, interrelationship of the disciplines. So here I go. Um, uh, let me uh, let me give, give this a shot. Um, I want to offer a brief theological statement uh, that is an attempt to provide a larger story that resonates with McIntyre's agenda for theology by being consistent with Revelation, subject to philosophical analysis, and useful to the task of theology in relating the various disciplines of the university uh, to one another. Romans 1, 18 to 32 makes clear the all-consuming lordship of the one creator God, a lordship that is both morally and substantially evident through the created order with respect to both his eternal power and his divine nature. The failure on the part of the creator God's human creatures to acknowledge him in devotion, which is parallel to their suppression of to their to their willful suppression of his evident divine presence and right to be worshipped is egregious and makes the human refusal both culpably deliberate and intentionally suppressive of the evident truths. The human substitution in worship of the products of their own hands uh, constitutes a rebellion that both evokes and justifies the divine displeasure uh, indeed, the ongoing human decline into moral dissolution is both a consequence and a symptom of the divine judgment. Uh, may I say that again? In Romans 1, it is, both, it is a consequence and a symptom of the divine judgment. Typically, uh, people say that Romans 1, uh, that same-sex behavior refers to uh, the, the basis of God's judgment. It actually, in the text, uh, is referred... M- you probably can't separate this perfectly, but it is more presented in the text as a con- as a uh, as a consequence of the judgment of God, based upon other sort of broad uh, sort of human the will to power, uh, the will to, uh, to 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 self autonomy. The rebellious self love of God's creatures is manifested in social dysfunctions that include same sex behavior and an even more extensive catalog of behaviors reflective of a deteriorating understanding of God, including murder, gossip, and rejection of the family order. These forms of uh, dysfunction epitomize the self love that manifests itself in a rebellious devotion to the idolatrous objects of humanity's making. Second, again in Romans uh, 118 following, this one God who is Lord of the created order of both nature and human nature, is the God of all. Since he's the single creator, all things come under his all-consuming reign and power, and thus there is an equity and uniformity uh, in his actions, whether of, of mercy or of wrath, toward all creatures. This decline of human flourishing is manifested externally, not only in their multivalent social dysfunction, dysfunctions and internal self-destruction, but also in the self-known existential plight of the human creatures. In spite of the dissolution of the mind and understanding implicit uh, in uh, the uh, self-love of the creatures, the breakdown of human wholeness is nonetheless knowable to the human mind and is further evidenced by the common human loss, Romans 7, of the unity of will and intellect, where one, individually or corporately, knows the good but cannot do it. This dissolution of will that simultaneously fractures the knowing of the good from the doing of it and engenders the cry of the heart uh, of the human condition, the famous, O wretched man that I am, of Romans 7.24, constitutes a moral and spiritual uh, bondage with roots in a larger uh, spiritual, and I, by this I'm making an, you know, an ontological assertion, a larger spiritual uh, cosmology. This cosmology is reflected throughout, but especially in Romans 6, 
where the underlying narrative, deducible from Paul's rhetoric, points to two vital spheres in this uh, larger uh, sort of cosmic narrative that Paul assumes. Points to two vital spheres, two dominions that compete for human allegiance. Though the exegetical discussions are detailed and subject to extensive evaluation, I suggest that the narrative involves a domain of, spir of evil spiritual forces in the text var variously referenced as sin and unrighteousness, to which humans, whether individually or corporately, have given themselves in devotion. The refusal to acknowledge and serve the Creator God, thereby substituting human interests for His purposes, as reflected in Romans 1, 18-32, is constitutive of a submission to the dark side of this two-sphere cosmology. Notice I did not say two equal spheres. A reversal, however, of this cosmic tragedy is effected both actually and potentially in this narrative that Paul presents through the faithful obedience of Jesus, the Son of God, who reverses, and by the way, I'm inclined to think that the expression often translated faith in Christ uh, throughout uh, the Pauline letters, uh, as many uh, commentators uh, point out, but doesn't make its way into our translations, could well be faithfulness of Christ, such that, such that it corresponds to the, the uh, statements in, uh, in Romans 5, uh, 12 and following, where Paul repeat, repeatedly refers to the obedience of Christ. A reversal of this cosmic tragedy is effected both actually and potentially through the faithful obedience of Jesus, the Son of God, who reverses by his obedience to God the initial disobedience of the human creatures, and through his death and resurrection breaks the stranglehold of the dark powers actually for himself and potentially for those who embrace him. This representative man, a second Adam, entered the alien sphere of rebellion against God and strong-armed the powers of darkness by refusing to do their bidding and by simultaneously doing the will of God, the Father. Though they killed the divine Son, God through him defeated the powers by vindicating his Son, reversing the effects of their dark works, which had culminated in his death, and by instituting in him the genesis of a restored creation, placing him as sovereign over a new empire, which through various actions... Uh, uh, over and within the created order, is simultaneously bringing the old order to an end and creating the new. The sub-narrative regarding the divine son, his entry into the sphere of the powers, his faithfulness to the will of God, God's raising him from the dead, uh, within the larger cosmic narrative is the gospel of early Christian traditions. It's the embracing of participation in, in this latter narrative, within the larger narrative, uh, that uh, inaugurates an exodus of the old creation and its inhabitants into the domain of the new creation. This resolution of the physical and existential dissolution of the human creatures, that is, its reversal of the destructive effects of human rebellion, involves necessarily the participation of the renewed creatures, involves necessarily the participation of the renewed creatures in the ongoing works of God. Thus, Benedict XVI's reference to freedom as not only a gift, Quote, but a summons to responsibility, close quote, is an expression of the very transfer that may take place within the larger narrative from one domain and one set of spiritual masters to another domain and a second, and this is not a, a misstatement, and a second bondage, justifiable by virtue of God's necessary status as the one creator, a second bondage to one's rightful master. It must be understood that in Romans 6, and there were some discussions this morning in the Novak presentation about uh, what's the definition of the word freedom. Well, of course, uh, in, in, there's, a, there's an interesting biblical frame of reference for that, too. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert on it, but uh, it, it's, uh, it ought to be brought to bear to that larger question. It must be understood that in Romans 6, there is no neutral perch for moral decision-making. There is only one. There is only slavery, and that's the language of the text. Whether to sin and the dark powers, or to God and the sphere of righteousness and ultimate restoration. Again, it's interesting to note that whereas the idea of freedom is is used in Romans six, it is precisely an emancipation. Freedom is not this you know, condition of having multiple options from which to make in a somewhat neutral setting uh, various choices. 
Freedom is an, emanci it is an emancipation that is being referred to, not some putative neutral ground for decision making lying between these spheres, these power spheres. One is either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness in the Pauline language. What Paul calls in another place, Galatians 5, freedom, is here synonymous with slavery to God. In Romans 6, each slavery has its outcome, whether eschatological death or life, and there are behaviors, impurity, lawlessness, and shameful deeds on the one hand, purity, etc. on the other, that are consistent with these ultimate ends. And again, it is embracing and thus participation in the internal narrative, the tradition of the gospel that predicates uh, the outcome. Please note that, in spite of my Protestant Baptist roots, this theological presentation is precisely not an ordo salutis, and certainly not a plan of salvation, though if any of you want to talk about it later, I'll be glad to. It, it, it's certainly not a plan of salvation in the four- or five-step tradition of an individual sinner's transaction with God. It contains, this, this, uh, this theological presentation, uh, this narrative, contains a narrative of the gospel, which, however, is very important to know, is set as a sub-narrative within a larger narrative of cosmic and universal creation, alienation, and resolution. The larger cosmology is important not only as a reflection of divine revelation, according to the traditional Christian sources, both inside and outside scripture, but also as an interpretive, and this is where, again, I offer this in, in, in uh, you know, uh, sort of taking up, I think, uh, McIntyre's suggestion that theology can provide a key. I offer this uh, uh, because I think it provides an interpretive horizon and a realistic framework for shaping, guiding, and integrating the work of the various academic disciplines as they examine, test, and seek to understand the proper concerns of their disciplines, as well as the underlying unity which leads to discoveries and insights, or should lead to discoveries and, in, uh, and insights of each discipline toward and across the frontiers of their own and other uh, and, uh, disciplines. Thus, I intend uh, this narrative uh, if it were refined and comprehensive enough, to serve uh, as an example of the kind of theological key referred to by Oscar McIntyre, one that theology may present and philosophy may refine with respect to language, coherencies, and concepts, and in the end help relate to the multitude of disciplines in the university. Again, I think this is part of the, of the project that universities, but certainly Christian universities, uh, ought to have. Going forward, the Christian university. As McIntyre has powerfully argued, the best setting for the generationally sustained philosophical inquiries related to an integrated cross-disciplinary analysis of the nature of things is the university. But also, again, our universities not only are typically indifferent to questions of the interrelationship of the disciplines, or further, how they may all relate to the greater whole, but also are, in fact, sad to say, in many instances, actively inimical to them. But, remember, still, Richard John Newhouse's reminder that, quote, there is no such thing as a university pure and simple, reminding that at least suggests, though it was not his, probably his main intent, but at least the second part of what I want to say, that we need not despair that all universities either are the same or must be the same. Nor should we assume that whatever universities we may have influence over are irrevocably committed to the paths they are on. There are signs of hope. And I specifically include any university that's capable, like this one, of sponsoring uh, or sending representatives uh, to a conference uh, like this, and any university that has administrators, but especially faculty, who are interested in assuming the burden of the long studies, the researches, the conversations, and the tasks that must be done, but that can be done, if we accept faithfully, if we accept faithfully the gift of learning, education, and the existence of the universities, and hear therein the summons to the spiritual and intellectual virtues implicit within that gift, that is the gift of the universities in our present reality. So what do we need? 
Well, certainly, as Professor McIntyre has reminded us, quote, any Catholic university in which such projects were to be successfully pursued would need to have structures and goals very different from those of the great secular research universities, and not just by reason of the central place, uh, and not just by reason of the central place given to the study of theology. Both its undergraduate and its graduate studies, especially in philosophy, I'm still quoting, but also more generally, would be very different. Close quote. I offer the following as some of the more obvious enabling resources that our universities must have if they are to have these distinctive structures and goals uh, that uh, McIntyre refers to. First, as I've already in fact said, we must have faculty members, and of course the politics of, of hiring, uh, frankly for our project at Baylor, was, I think, maybe the central political battle in terms of strategies that, that was encountered. And, and unless, uh, unless, you know, people can figure out how to get their hands around or grasp the nettle of this problem, uh, in my view, all else uh, may well be lost. Uh, now, one can go, you know, around and outside the university and, you know, start with the uh, peripatetic schools or something all over again, but... It, Working with the university as we have it in those political structures, grasping this, taking this problem and dealing with this is, is of, uh, of the utmost uh, importance. We must have faculty members who are willing to take on the project of recovering a commitment to the whole. Being a, a, a Christian scholar is no guarantee that, that that scholar is interested in the whole, W-H-O-L-E. He or she may just be interested in what he or she wanted to pursue uh, through their subdisciplinary, isolated, silo-like, you know, graduate program. And that's, that does not, given the state of things the way they are now, that does not further the projects I think that all of us have to be, are, are interested in. People like that can certainly won't fight, and they can be part of those those narrow studies that are necessary so that so that you know truths bubble up. But if they don't care whether those truths you know sort of run out to the frontiers of their discipline, and don't have some way of thinking about that and contributing to that, they may not at this point in the history of universities in America be the right people, or certainly they're not as preferable as people who care about the whole. We have to have faculty members who are willing to take on the project of recovering a commitment to the whole. To understanding the unity of truth, admitting there is such, even if we don't know it, which obviously we don't fully know it, or we wouldn't be there researching and studying. To understand the unity of truth that lies beneath and ties together the single universe. Again, these are theistic assumptions. The single universe of the one creator God. And again, quoting McIntyre, People who appreciate the, quote, underlying unity to the inquiries of each discipline into the various aspects of the natural and social, close quote. Faculty must ask, what relationship does each discipline have to the others? And how can each discipline contribute to an understanding of the whole? And another question that must be asked, what are the questions and processes that must be instituted? And by, it's not just a matter of asking questions, but, you know, you know, practices are socially embedded, and thus, you know, what what are the processes, institutions, forms that that we can institutionalize to to give these processes a future? The, the asking of these questions a future. And I, again, I draw upon uh, my own experience, but the Institute for Faith and Learning at Baylor, the, the the Center for Ethics and Culture here, these are these are institutional, valuable institutional resources to enable institutions as a matter of habit, so that you don't like the three frogs, you know, of Miss Picklewiggle, they have to retrain the frogs, you know, every three days because they they forget, they have no sense of history. Uh, the, we have to have institutions have to keep asking these questions and and um, and being reminded that these questions are being asked. What are the questions and processes that must be instituted to see, since the practices are largely not present, that such questions are pressed in a way that is sufficiently disciplined and persistent enough to motivate others, who, since we're not starting our universities over, to motivate others around us to engage them? These faculty must be willing to take risks. 
I think it's part of the profile. They must be willing to work outside their own academic comfort zones. It's not true that every faculty member was picked last in recess growing up. <laughs> but there is a tendency in the generalized personality profile not to be long on risk taking. We are a conservative, a socially conservative group. Uh, not by virtue of social conservatism, but, uh, but it, in terms of our personality profiles. And so we have to have some people who are, who are risk takers. They must be willing to work outside their own academic comfort zones. They must be willing to encourage, talk to, and themselves support strong departments of philosophy and theology. Not so that these latter departments should be the kings and queens of the university. No. But for the sake, but so that they may be present in the university. Do you know how many universities now, of course, not only, I mean, not having a theology department, that's de rigueur. It's now becoming very common that universities don't have philosophy departments. But for the sake, you know, supporting them, allowing them to exist and do their work and, and being dialogue partners uh, with the philosophers and theologians for the sake of a service that enables the rigorous pursuit of the interests of the other disciplines in a way that, again, extends their frontiers toward more comprehensive questions of meaning and purpose and human flourishing. Second, our universities must have, I, I wrote, a curriculum, but obviously it, we could use the plural, must have curricula, but they must, but a central curriculum, particularly an undergraduate uh, curriculum, is vital. Undergraduates, you know, need a shared experiences for, for shaping and formation. And the, the cafeteria style that universities have now is absolutely uh, detrimental and a hindrance to all the kinds of things that, that we want to ask. How in the world can we get uh, you know, young people to ask serious questions about the, the relationship of, of what they're learning to other disciplines when they have nothing in common about which to speak? The, the conversation ends before it, it, ever, it ever starts. Our universities must have a curriculum that is built around the assumption, as it was generations ago, centuries ago, that we are seeking an underlying unity and that there are purposeful questions to which all the disciplines and subdisciplines may contribute. Where university curricula are now given over in growing measures to economic development and careerism, we must attempt, perhaps remembering how the prophets of old lived out their instructive parables, uh, we must attempt pilot programs. I'll refer to Baylor again, and we've done the same thing at Houston Baptist. Uh, you know, we, we started there, and, uh, and at the Houston Baptist, we have started an honors college that engaged great text. It is, in many ways, these programs are, are pilot programs within the universities, hoping to sort of model the kinds of things that, that you think could be done more broadly. If others see, get interested, Good ideas usually uh, have children, and uh, it, it's, it's actually entirely possible that, uh, that uh, you know, good practices can encourage good practices and that they're contagious. Other internal models of academic practice that may ultimately extend themselves across the curriculum and engender broader conversations. Third, we must have administrators who are not mere technocrats, managers, and or organizational engineers. Read my most recent book on leadership yet? <laughs> administrators must understand thank you, it was sarcasm uh, administrators must understand at least enough to sympathize with the nature of the project that we hereby espouse and they must be willing to extend resources in its pursuit the growing practice of finding college presidents who do not have experience in academe you know, when I first wrote this I thought Oh, that's, you know, that's a terrible thing. On the other hand, you have to ask yourself, say, how's the other pattern working out for you? Uh, you know, it's not necessarily a cause for alarm. It is entirely possible that, that a certain amount of naivete from someone outside of academe may be uh, what the doctor orders. Uh, whatever the case, uh, a given president uh, and, and all chief administrators must have the requisite humility to acknowledge the gifts of others, though they have to have the strength of purpose. I'll refer to this in a minute by referring to it as kind of a magisterial function. Uh, so they have to have the requisite humility to acknowledge the gifts of others, and, and he or she, the given administrator, may well be able to learn more of the larger mission of the university, in any case, 
you know, support the needed direction. At the very least, it's vital that provosts and deans, chairs, and academic directors, nor should we omit the leaders of student life. They should understand and, and themselves be continually renewed and informed regarding the project of a university that takes seriously the confession Jesus Christ is Lord. We must have administrators at every level who are, who are courageous enough to break with the hegemony of the current traditions of fragmentation and subdisciplinary professionalism wherever they are found, whether externally in ranking systems and accrediting bodies, huge wars to be fought there about the very nature of the university and the nature of the kinds of universities and the kinds of questions we want to pursue, or, or whether those forces are found internally in theology departments that are themselves ingrown and isolated, in philosophy departments that promote a professionalism whereby the philosophers speak only to other philosophers, or in biology or other hard sciences where faculty reject the inquiries of historians and philosophers as irrelevant to their real work. Such administrators must, especially if they are not in a Catholic tradition, be willing to serve, listen for the word magisterial here, uh, be willing to serve in connection with, so there's a pattern of authority that must, of course, be respected, in connection with the founding documents, the history and traditions of the university, the trustees and directors of the university, and the faculty, staff, and alumni who understand and are committed to these larger questions, administrators of, of, of all levels must be courageous enough and willing to serve as a kind of magisterial check and shaping force upon the direction of the university. I mean, if you don't believe it, just ask yourself, what kind of university will a faculty senate create? Um, without the willingness of administrators and, and faculty to be strong and to, and to take up the summons to responsibility that we have been given within the, 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 the the existent gift of the university that, that we have been charged with. Without the willingness of administrators and faculty to shape the curriculum and the budgets of the university towards these ultimate goods, consistent with our understanding of the Creator God who has revealed Himself through Jesus Christ, our universities will continue to be captive to the dominant forces of our culture and specifically, this is McIntyre's uh, phrase, to the practical atheisms that now permeate our curricula. The freedom we enjoy as universities and as individuals who represent the practices of academia. The freedom we enjoy to exercise the moral and intellectual virtues is a gift. And thus, it is indeed a call to responsibility, a summons. We do not have the luxury of posing as neutral observers who may opt out. Ours is a summons to obedience if we are to achieve the goods internal to our practices and implicit within our calling. says the only Greeks who have the Aragon of the law are those who don't worship idols. 
are not most of them, but particularly us that now key for that. Uh, mm-hmm. So the idea is you'd only get it right if you worship rightly. Can one get theology in place rightly if you don't worship rightly? Well, I, I would certainly not want to say, I mean, I would, I would not say any, I, I agree you totally, worship is absolutely integral and inextricably linked to all the, 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 the virtues that we, we seek to pursue, the intellectual virtues, uh, etc., and all the tasks that we do. Uh, I think uh, sometimes, though, uh, also the people of God live in a foreign land, and uh, you, we are in exile, and you, you find... You know, uh, the children of Israel in exile don't have the temple, they don't have the priesthood, they don't have the monarch, they don't have the sacrificial system, but they, they find new forms and new ways in which to, to exercise uh, their devotion. I was talking about the Christian university and the rupture, oh, for, worship, sorry. The rupture for worship uh, oh. took place in right. our lifetime. And when I was a younger man, I still worked at right. Oxford Colleges, no longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, perhaps the transformation of the death of the Christian university was as much uh, due to the marginalization of worship than any intellectual mistake. I, I, I agree. I think you, they all go hand in hand because worship itself, of course, is also an intellectual uh, exercise, among other things. Uh, and so I, I, I agree. I, one of the things... I, you know, don't want to dwell on this too much, but one of the things that one of the conclusions I came to from the the war that we went through and the struggle at Baylor is that uh, it, it goes beyond simply providing good answers to to questions. I mean, there is a spiritual bondage and, and a and there was a spiritual battle that went on, and that's why I mean I take very seriously. I, I said I was making an ontological claim. I take very seriously the the. the Cosmology that Paul has there. I, I don't think you can. I don't think you can understand, as William Stringfellow said, the the great evil of the 20th century. You know, whether it's you know Stalin, Hitler, and so on, without uh, understanding that we are wrestling against powers of darkness. And uh, and worship is is the frontier at which uh, the church engages uh, the presence of God, which is also a battle against the powers. Which is the Pauline point that yeah. you worship, but it's not a Roman creator. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Leslie Ann Dyer, a product of Robert Swan's oh. paper, and now a graduate student here at the University of Leslie Ann It's a comment slash question. Um, you were talking about interdisciplinarity, and I think it's interesting if you if you go through a lot of the the, the job postings, what job postings there are right now, they're yes. always looking for interdisciplinary X, Y, and Z. And, but, and yet, even as this interdisciplinary narrative is becoming, uh, mm-hmm. you know, on, on the rise, there, there's, there's a growing skepticism, I think, among a lot of scholars as to what exactly interdisciplinary means. So I was wondering if you might have some comments as to, to what, this might be, I, I'm thinking, this is in some sense, the draw, move towards interdisciplinarity is a move towards wholeness and a desire for wholeness, but without the, the, the truth there that you might have in a Christian university. It's right. going to yeah, I, I agree. It's a mixed blessing. I mean, I, I think the effort is clearly moves into the spaces between disciplines so that you're asking questions. You may not necessarily be asking questions about the whole, though, still. It could just be a new you know, a new silo built between two other silos. Okay. And so the, the willingness to ask those questions is critical. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, universities typically, uh, you know, it, without budgets, everything it gets is a budget and a turf war uh, over budgets yeah. is where these disciplines come. So, that's, so it, again, I, I would, I'd want to make sure that we have great coverage where all the disciplines that match the, the obvious things that we know about the world, uh, but you always have to, yeah, press press the frontiers. Uh. Question back here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the task for the faculty. I'm wondering uh, what role do you think there is for students to play in the new university? That is a wonderful question. I haven't I haven't thought about it too much, except I I do uh, again speak from my experience. One of the things. I mean, there is a political role that students uh, can play, and administrators, believe it or not, actually do usually try to listen to what students say. So the, the, the political role is, and again, I don't apologize for this, I mean, again, we, we, our practices are socially embedded, and so asking questions, you know, what, you know when, when a student is told, well, I'm sorry, don't ask that question here, That's, you know, we don't, we don't treat that. I mean, a student ought to press back. Well, why can't I ask that kind of question? Uh, and I think... Uh, I think, uh, you know, being interested in things that maybe uh, take the professor out of his or her comfort zone, being interested in questions 
uh, and, and getting others interested in questions that, that maybe uh, administrators don't want asked uh, is a good thing. I think students can have a role. Another thing I know I always did uh, when I met with students uh, at Baylor who were very sympathetic with the project we were doing. They loved the changes in the university, loved the unbelievable faculty that we were, we were bringing there. And yet the, the other side of it was that we were at least temporarily losing, you know, the battle uh, at the at the level of the of the, of the board and, and other critical points. I, I told those students, I said, look, stay interested in Baylor, stay interested in these questions, because you know, 20 years from now, you could be a regent of the university, and I hope you will be. I mean, one of the problems that the, the cycle that you get into is you, you have to have strong. I didn't mention boards here, but you have to have strong boards. Well, I did mention them once, but <laughs> students have a, a critical. They should ask questions. While we're waiting for another question, Robert, a practical matter. The, the, um, the response to the problem you talked about has taken two forms, and you've been involved in both of them, reforming established prosperous universities from the inside, or taking a university that's not quite formed yet yeah. and building it up. And in the Catholic world, especially, there's a, a lot of new universities. Well, where do you think the most hopeful Things, speaking as someone who's been in the battle, where are things most hopeful? Should we stick with older established places and try to do work there, or should we? Yeah, I I think my well, my first thought is um, I mean I, you're absolutely right. I mean I was I was committed to working inside uh, Baylor to, uh, to the, the advantage of course is an institution has a great history, structure, resources. Um, but then, of course, the, the sort of ideological battle as to the character of the university was, was what was going on. Now, I'm, I'm actually very encouraged uh, about Baylor, and I want, I want to say that. I, I think the faculty who are there, again, you asked the question about students, but faculty, there's a grassroots, you know, constancy of asking questions and, and suggesting projects and hiring people that is making a difference. I'm, I'm optimistic. The board of directors, the regents at Baylor, has, is, is, is making a change. The, the difficulty at, uh, at Houston Baptist is um, that, you know, less tradition, younger university, don't have the resources, don't have the visibility. The advantage is that there's not an ideological battle to fight there. Being, being smaller, by and large, the university has uh, sort of maintained its, its, uh, its faithful traditions. It's more malleable. It's, it's, it's easier to change. Uh, and we have the advantage of being in a major city. It's very unusual, not for Catholics, but it's very unusual for Protestants to have universities in major cities. Uh, Protestants sort of put universities out in the country so the kids wouldn't be, you know, adversely influenced. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so so it, it's a, we have tremendous resources. When I was president of Baylor, I used to go to Houston all the time to try to raise money. Uh, from huge foundations. Well, we have we have great uh, support, and it's but it's a matter of, of building it. Uh, so, I don't know, David. I I think either strategy will work, and I, I think we we if you if you're in a place and there's the possibility for change, Baylor was at a point where it could still sort of internally renew. Uh, if I were at another university, I won't call a name, but I mean uh, I can think of other sort of Protestant universities in the state of Texas. They may well be too far gone to change. On the other hand, I I still think faculty there, you never know. You should never give up hope. Faculty there should continue to ask those questions. You never know what what might happen. But uh, but there, there, is, there will be, this is not a profane expression, uh, there will be hell to pay uh, when, when you try to change. Um, but I don't, I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know which to prefer. Uh, it will go on Michael Pepperland ahead of us. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier faculty... Uh, well, faculty hires and the difficulty of faculty autonomy. How did you deal with you know, departments that were far gone in their hiring process? Um, do you just have the provost exercise the veto and what's the political cost of that? Or how, did, how do you envision that happening? Yeah, in, in a word, I mean, Don and David should probably respond to that. But we, we basically, I, I, at first I made a decision, I'm going to be involved in every interview. And, and then... And Don supported that, and then we developed uh, eventually uh, through Don and David. Uh, it created a furor, uh, and even in the ad, what kind of ad do we put out? Well, you can't, you know, people didn't want us mentioning that we were a Christian university and expected that because we wouldn't get good chemists if we did that, and so on. Uh, so 
every step of the way there was a battle, but you know, uh, Don was very patient. He'd work with people, and, and so we developed processes for hiring. And yes, I, I did exercise the, the veto, not nearly as often uh, as people thought. In fact, the interesting thing was, I, I'll bet you that I exercised the veto eight times more for acad reasons of academic quality than I did for theological reasons. You know, people would say, oh, well, you know, theological reasons. But, but Don and David, why don't you all respond well, a little bit to that? We would get a lot of pushback from departments when we rejected their candidates. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we explained our position and uh, asked them to continue the search. And, uh, you know, every time it turned out, we got a better person than they anticipated. Absolutely. That's the way it works. And I noticed, again, it, over time, I mean, they they it, you brought us better candidates, and uh, the process got better. And, and then I think David really expanded the uh, the search, the, the evaluation committees. And, yeah, what, 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 one thing I would just add to that is, is that you end up making practical decisions that you didn't intend to make on a practical basis, right? So you drop from the ideal down to an evaluation of who's willing to play ball and who doesn't want to play ball. Then you find ways to funnel opportunities and, uh, and, and positions to the people that will play ball. But then strategically, in the light of what Robert has been telling you, we, we kept to the game plan that we felt that you had to build a very strong philosophy department. Right? That would be one of the key pieces. And we, so we have, we, we have, in a sense, forgive the silos metaphor, but we have silos in which the, the 2012 vision that, that Robert and others put together is working beautifully. And we do have outlying departments which are still, you know, pretty far from that goal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but what happens is, and this is, uh, this is making a, a virtue of necessity, right? Uh, what happens is, is that the great success of the successful department creates a certain kind of natural academic envy in the have-nots. You just have to be a lot more patient than it is my nature to want to be, but, you know, eventually, eventually that starts to work for you. And it's surprising how much of it is working right now. So that, you know, there were days that we had, uh, Don and, and Robert and I had five, eight years ago, where, where we would not have imagined actually that we'd have been as far along as we are today. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we really have a lot to be thankful for here. The, and use of budget, and, you know, they've implied this use of budgets. Uh, Don had a great idea too, and he talked about this a few years ago here. But uh, we we did create, uh, you know, Don really uh, came to me and, and with the idea that we create, we ended up creating university professors and distinguished professors. And this was a, and this was a way of salting areas. And we would do, you know, nationwide searches for, for outstanding scholars, and you know, it could be in any discipline. But if you salt this one, I can think of it, this happened several times. I think of one whole school where. The school is actually pretty good, but by bringing in one person, it, it, that person was networked, brought in others, and, and the school is just remarkable today because of just a, a, few, a few changes. So it, it can happen. It's a pebble in the pond. But it link, you know, they link up. Let's go beyond. Is there be a place for service learning in the division that you're expounding? Yes, sir. I, I, I think any, any way of, of learning uh, is... Uh, is, uh, is, is legitimate. Uh, that's my short answer. You know, one anecdote about the hiring thing, some of you in this room were here for a, a sort of great occasion. The first time Baylor and Notre Dame, sorry, we didn't talk about football, you know, on October 31st, Reformation Day, as Protestants know it, in 19, what year was that, Robert? Uh, 70, uh, 97, or when Baylor played right, right, Notre Yeah, uh, 28. Uh, uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. The first time in history, we had a, we had a seminar on uh, Friday afternoon here with Don Stromkopf, who was in Provost at Baylor, uh, having an encounter with our Provost here at Notre Dame, talking about this very, this very question. And Don went first, and uh, people asked questions about how you have a hiring, and he said, "Well, we interview, I interview, and every faculty member considered at Baylor." And Robert Sloan interviews almost every faculty member. And we ask them questions like, do you go to church? And where do you go to church? <laughs> and then Don, we had a secretary call pastors of these churches to find out that uh, where they went to church. And he told us that he was forward wise, I recall. And our provost 
was, was horrified. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing couldn't be done at a university like Notre Dame. Uh, now, we did win the football game. <laughs> 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 that in that little, I mean, there was a sort of seriousness of purpose in what you said. That's what, um, if I could comment on the distinguished professor, uh, and relating back to the, the contribution of Notre Dame to our effort, I remember reading when I first became provost at Baylor uh, a document from Notre Dame called Colloquy 2000. And those of you who know Notre Dame's history know that that was at the beginning of uh, Father Malloy's presidency, I think. And there was a huge discussion about where Notre Dame would be in 10 years. And this was, I think, put together in 1990. So by 2000, where would we be? But one of the elements of that, colloquy, and the paper that came out of it, or the document, was Baylor, I mean, Notre Dame would appoint 50 distinguished professors over the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. And, ah, and there's an idea right. that Baylor needs to consider. Right. And these would be all endowed in Notre Dame. We, we haven't accomplished that yeah. better. <laughs> but we have, yeah. we have a good number now of distinguished professors. So we did. I mean, the, the strategy from word go was centered around faculty. Uh, distinguished university and just the day in and day out processes of hiring. And, of course, then that gets transferred into the pre-tenure review and tenuring processes, too. And these, all of these people have been of enormous help to us in recruiting other good faculty oh. because of their connections. Yeah. Well, you know, I think uh, Robert has, uh, you did live up to that title, and I think you've made my introduction look uh, mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. why he has been one of the most significant figures in higher education in the last couple of decades. Thank you very much. Thank you.